Mr. McCoy here with part 29 of The Ear, The Eye and the Arm. As you recall, very wise, Obama Shavari said, the God One and Ambassador tore open Tendai's shirt and jumped back as though he'd been scalded. What's that? The she elephant leaned forward. Oh, it's only an old Nadoro. The spirit mediums in the villages wear them. Supposed to have power, although if you ask me, it's only superstition. It's unusual looking, though. The woman came closer. Tendai stared back at her with the cold, steely gaze he had learned from his father. That's the real thing. The ancient kings wore Nadoros made out of shell. Even then they were valuable. Why don't you sell it and let the brat go? I could help you, you stupid woman. When will you get it through your head that we don't want money? Snarled Obama Shafari. The boy is an ideal messenger to our gods. He's the son of General Masika. He's got the heart of a lion and he's wearing the symbol of Zimbabwean spirituality. Nothing could be more perfect. When we break him down, and we will, his soul will glow like hot coal in the dark country of our gods. Oh, they will certainly notice him. Tendai shifted his steely gaze from the she-elephant to Obama Shavari. See that? said the Gondwanan ambassador. Looks just like his father. He placed a box of instruments on a stand where Tendai could see them. The long, the jagged, the hooked surfaces picked up the light from a rack of black candles against the wall. Beware. I am a deadly mamba, wrestler of leopards, a hive of hornets, a man among men. Tendai chanted the war song in his head. The warmth of the Nodoro spread through his body. Even though he couldn't move his arms or legs, he was still a warrior. His spirit would fight them. He would never carry their loathsome messages. Excellent, Ambassador Shafari said with a chuckle. Something crashed on the landing dock. The masks all turned at the noise. One of the limos must have broken loose, said the porcupine. It's the wind. The building's really dancing tonight. Fix it, Obama Shafari commanded. But at that instant, an amazingly tall man in torn clothes threw open the glass door and began firing into the room. What do you think is coming now? Share with your fellow listener. Arm was shaken up by the fall, but the Mahundro immediately ordered him to rise. Get moving. They're alert as a pack of hungry hyenas in there. Arm staggered to his feet. His body throbbed with cold and scratches. He drew the Nirvana gun, threw open the door, and began firing as rapidly as he could. There was no lack of targets. He brought down three masks before they rallied to attack him. The hatred of a thousand angry animal deaths boiled at him from the bloated spirits of the masks. The room was filled with roars and howls and snarls and bleeding, but only Arm could hear it. The spirits circled, nipping at his heels. They blew their hot breath in his ears and dripped their poisonous saliva on his skin. He turned, bewildered. Fight! Don't let them confuse you, shouted the Mahandra. Arm saw Tendai tied to a chair. Rita and Kuda crouched at the feet of the she-elephant and the Godwanan ambassador stood at her side. The detective raised his gun, but something shifted in the shadows beyond the chair and captured his attention. It was the hole in the ocean of desire Arm had noticed in the starlight room. No, you fool, the Mahandro shouted. Hello, Arm, said the presence behind the mask leaning against the wall. This mask was large and curiously indistinct, but Arm suspected he wouldn't want to see it clearly. You've never known peace, have you? presence whispered, always listening to the emotions of others, always feeling their petty yammering on your nerves. What you need is a rest. The presence looked out at him like an old grandfather, a kind old grandfather. It's a trap, cried the Mahandro. You, said the presence, you squeaking little goody-goody. You can't even keep your own people in line. They don't even fear you. Shoot the Gondwanan ambassador commanded the Mahandro. Arm took a step forward, but he felt tired, so tired. The hole hovered before him, inviting him with its cool, restful depths. The gun slid out of his fingers to the floor. He moved toward the hole with the voice of the Mahandro growing ever weaker inside him. Too late, he saw the eyes of the big head mask open. Too late, he remembered what the Mahandro had told him earlier. It was not a hole, 
but a mouth. So what's going on? Share what you think with your fellow listener. Tendai saw a strange man enter through the door. He was long and skinny like a wall spider, but he was definitely a friend. The man shot three masks with a Nirvana gun. Tendai had practiced with one at the police firing range and recognized it. The strange person aimed his gun at Obamba Shirari and suddenly stopped. He began shaking as though he had a high fever. Please, please don't stop now, prayed Tendai. The man seemed hypnotized. He was looking beyond Tendai at the location of the big head mask. No one moved. Tendai realized a silent struggle was taking place. He had no idea what it was, but everyone seemed to feel it. The candles sputtered, although there wasn't a breeze at this end of the room. A murmur of sound rose just beyond the level of his hearing. Tendai felt his skin prickle. The tension snapped. The man dropped his gun and fell to the floor. His head struck with a terrible crack, but Tendai was certain he was already dead before he reached the ground. Before he could despair at this turn of events, something happened inside his chest. The heat spread out from the Dodoro, a hundred, a thousand times stronger than before. The strength of it frightened him, but it was a clean fear such as one might have before a magnificent force of nature, a volcano, for example. You're a little young for a spirit medium, but you'll have to do said a voice inside him. P please, stammered Tendai. Who, who are you? The Mahandro, my young warrior. Aha, I recognize this Nadoro. It was worn by Mahapapa himself. It feels good to get inside it again. Tendai was filled with wonder. The Mahandro, and it shows him. He was so filled with awe, he almost forgot the desperate situation he was in, but the tribal spirit soon woke him up. No time to pat yourself on the back. You know what you're here to do, don't you? Yes, sir, said Tendai. I have to act through humans, as spirits always do, so both of us will have to look for a weak spot in the Gondwanan defenses. If the worst happens, you're going to die. You know that. You do know that. Tendai swallowed. Yes, he knew it, but that was what warriors sometimes had to do. The important thing was to die for the right thing and with dignity. That's right, little lion. I can see I made the right choice. Tendai's heart swelled with pride. He looked up at the encircling masks. They were apparently waiting for the effects of the Nirvana gun to wear off the Gondwanans who had been shot by the strange man. Let them wake up fully, said Obama Shafari. We can't do this ceremony with too many missing. As the moments ticked past, Tendai caught a glimpse of what the Mahandra really was. It, for the spirit, was both male and female, stretched back to the first human who raised his or her shaggy head from the immediate business of finding food. She or he became aware of the land. He saw the good red soil and clean water flowing through it, the plants that sprang up and the animals that bounded through them, and he knew that this is where he belonged. This was home. Ever since that time, all the men and women who had cared for the land added their voices to Mahandro. Tendai saw in the distant shadowy way the country of Zimbabwe with its millions of souls, and his attention was drawn it from the larger landscape to the room. His vision became sharper. He saw Kuda sitting on the floor with Rita's arms around him. His little brother was planning to trip the mast next to him. Rita was thinking about how to reach the Nirvana gun. Last of all, Tendai came to the she-elephant. Her, he said, she can't be one of your people. They are all my children, said the Mahandro. With the tribal spirit guiding him, he saw the she-elephant as she once had been, a fat, unwanted child. Nobody cared for her. She ran away from home. The only way you get by in this world, said the young she-elephant, is to bash people before they bash you. Tendai saw her build an empire in Dead Man's Vlay. The Vlay people were her real family. She didn't lure them there. She didn't lure them there. They came willingly. She bullied and exploited them, but to the mournful, unwanted Vlay people, she represented home. He gazed at her in wonder. It was difficult to understand the feeling the Mahandro had about her. The closest he could come to describing it was, she belongs. 
At that instant, the she-elephant noticed him watching her. Her eyes widened. Tendai felt a smile break out on his face. It was a good, friendly, belonging kind of smile. The big woman shuddered and turned away. It's time for the ceremony, said Obama Shavari. Reverently, the Gondwanans carried the big head mask from the shadows to place it before Tendai. The darkness flowed along with it. Even in the light of the candles, its form seemed incomplete. Tendai could focus on a part, the little teeth or scraps of scalp, and another area would collapse. When he shifted his eyes, the mask seemed whole, and yet an instant later, something else would grow dim. It isn't completely in this world, explained the Mahandro. The ceremony will give it substance. The big head mask is the most ancient and powerful of our fetishes, Obama Shavari said in a deep voice. It has passed from man to man for a thousand years. It has been called up by the other masks and by countless sacrifices. Only it has the power to rouse the Godwan and gods from their long sleep. They're not asleep. They're bone idle, remarked the Mahandra. To die grimaced, he wished he felt as cheerful as the Mahandra. You, child of Zimbabwe, will be the messenger of our will. Look upon the mask and no terror. I'm not carrying any of your messages, said Tendai. That's telling him, ow, cried Rita as the porcupine mask pulled her hair. Good, good, Obama Shavari said pleasantly. Be defiant. It will make your eventual surrender that much more powerful. Tendai glared at him with hate. His heart was beating very fast. Now it was going to be real. Now it would hurt. The masks formed a ring around the chair. Obama Shavari wasn't able to join because he had lost the warthog spirit. The Godwanans began to chant. It was like nothing Tendai had ever heard. It started low, a mutter of angry bees in an underground hive. It rose to the surface, coming nearer. Tendai knew the men were making it, but it seemed to hang in the air without direction or source. It was exactly, he broke out in a sweat, the kind of sound ghosts would make as they gathered in a dark forest. Stop that! You're too old for ghost stories, said the Mahandro. Sorry, said Tendai, but the noise was unnerving all the same. Gradually, one after the other, the spirits that attended the masks took up residence. The men jerked as they were possessed. The sound grew louder. Barks, yowls, grunts, and hyena laughter filled the air. It was the animals trapped as messengers. They circled the chair, calling for their master who fed only on humans. The presence that had lurked in the shadows began to awaken in the big head mask. Its shape became clearer, but just as it seemed to come into focus, something would fade. It's because you destroyed the warthog mask, said the Mahandro. The animals' voices are weakened. That was a good trick, Tendai. What made you think of it? I don't know. I just didn't want them to have it all their own way. Tendai replied. Obama Shavari wrung his hands as he watched the big head mass struggle to take shape. The animal messengers went faster and faster. Their panting filled the air. The spirit-ridden men writhed as though stricken with disease. The big head mass suddenly leaped into sharp definition. It came alive, more terrible than any nightmare. The eyes opened. Tendai cried out, You again! said the presence. Fine warrior you've got this time. The last one was delicious, by the way. It's not over till it's over, said the Mahandro. Brave words. If the only soldiers you can come up with are freaks and children, Zimbabwe deserves to be eaten. Obama Shavari selected one of the knives and approached Tendai. He raised it to make the first cut. The eyes of the big head mask followed the blade greedily. Snap! For one horrified instant, everyone in the room seemed turned to stone. Everyone, that is, except the she-elephant. She tossed the two halves of the big head mask to the floor and dusted off her knee. Women can be warriors too, Mahalo said with satisfaction. Then everything went berserk. The masks whirled in panic as their spirits abandoned them. The animal messengers fled with cries of woe. Rita tried to grab the Nirvana gun, but Obama Shavari knocked her away. In revenge, she yanked a rug out from under the baboon mask who tumbled to the floor. 
Even Kuda ran around aiming punches with his little fists. The she-elephant gathered an armful of statues and was using them with great skill as missiles. The she-elephant couldn't destroy the big head mask until it was entirely in the real world, explained the Mahandro. That's what I was waiting for. You communicated with her very well, by the way. I did, Tendai said. The masks appeared demoralized by the destruction of their most powerful fetish. They crouched on the floor with their hands on their heads. Obama Shavari tried to shoot at the she-elephant with the Nivarlikan, but so far all he could manage was to dodge heavy gold statues. When you smiled at her, you reminded her of something she forgot a long time ago. It's her land and her people. The Gondwanan ambassador struck the she-elephant with a blast, but she shook it off like a gnat bite. She roared and barreled straight for him. We need help, yelled the porcupine, rousing himself from his paralysis. He ran to the door and flung it open. Instantly, he tried to shut it, but it was too late. In poured a crowd of excited waiters, cooks, and dishwashers, brandishing mallets, cooking forks, and other unpleasant weapons. Dirty child killers, shouted the chief cook. Murderers, yelled the salad master. Stingy tippers, screamed the waiters. The masks ran around frantically. Ambassador Shivari, please wake up, they implored. But Obama Shivari lay on the floor with his head at a funny angle. The she-elephant calmly stuffed her pockets with jewels, and the battle raged on around her. A pair of elegantly dressed women knelt by the strange man who had come from the landing dock. I'm going to leave you now, said the Mahabro to Tendai. You ought to think about becoming a spirit medium. You have a real talent. I'll miss you, Tendai said. I'll always be around, young lion, for as long as the land of Zimbabwe exists. And then it was gone. Tendai felt so lonely he could hardly stand it. And Adoro grew cold. It was only a lump of seashell. Tears rolled down his cheeks. Now's a stupid time to cry, said Rita, busily using a sacrificial knife to cut through the ropes that bound her brother. Everything's turned out fine. It would appear as if the ear and the eye and the arm has come to a conclusion. Is that true? What do you think? Share with your fellow listener. And now, moments more of the ear, the eye and the arm. Mother could hardly believe her good fortune when the door opened. She already had her makeshift troops ready. They swarmed inside, hitting right and left. Mother brought down a few masks herself. Then she saw what she had been waiting for all those long months. Rita was cutting Tendai free from a chair. Kuda was trying to help with a wicked-looking steak knife. Tendai struggled to stand, but his knees sagged. Yes, there is more to come as the ear, the eye, and the arm concludes.